Hello there, it's Linda here from Just For Tummies and welcome to today's video, Healthy Aging with Herbal Medicine. And I'm very pleased to say that my guest once again, she's been a guest before, is medical herbalist Catherine Bell Chambers. So when we talk about aging, we're not going to be talking about the outward signs of aging, although we will cover the skin a little bit and how aging affects the skin. We're more interested in aging of certain systems of the body and organs of the body that can cause disease, premature aging of those organs due to chronic inflammation and oxidative stress. So um, I'm going to add Catherine to the video. <laughs> what we just put in your mouth, Catherine? <laughs> an ice cube. <laughs> uh, oh, an ice cube, an ice cube. <laughs> because it's so warm. I know. Um, I've made sure that I've got an insulated bottle. Um, Me too. <laughs> of water with ice cubes in it, just so that, you know, we can wet our whistle as we're going through. <laughs> Are you okay? I am fine, yes. Um, I've got the window open. I've not put the fan on because when I tested it with the microphone earlier, it was um, it was a nightmare. <laughs> Crazy. I'm the same. I've got my door closed. I've got the window the window open. I haven't got the fan on because, in fact, the, the building over the way. Can, can you hear any background noise? I can't. No. You can't hear a digger. No. <laughs> right. That's great. Um, anyway, it's good to see you again, Catherine. Thanks for your good time. To see you too, Linda. Um, I saw you on Instagram this morning. Uh, yes. I'm just scrolling through Instagram. I don't know if you did it yesterday or if you did it this morning, but you were talking about the importance of hydration, uh, yes. you know, in particular during this hot spell. But actually, as far as healthy ageing is concerned, hydration is absolutely essential. You know, making sure that we're taking in enough water for all the cells in our body to function properly is, you know, it's the single simplest thing you can do to improve your health. It yes. reduces incidence of headaches. It reduces incidence of um, of constipation. Mm -hmm. You know, if you do tend to IBSD, you need extra water because you're passing out more, you know, through through the bowels as well as the kidneys. Yes, and yes. Go on, sorry, I, I'm sorry. I, see, I see elderly people reducing the amount of... Of fluids they take in because you know getting up and going to the bathroom is uncomfortable you know and it just means they don't have to get up as often oh. but that leads to kidney problems it leads i know to i know I, I keep trying to emphasize to my mom you know the importance of drinking just plain water especially during these uh, these hotter months and she's you know she does i mean she drinks lots of tea not so much coffee um but I, you know the emphasis on just plain water. So what 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 have you got there, Catherine? What, what are you drinking out of? Is it just is it like a stainless steel thermos? It's a, stain, it's a double walled stainless steel um drinking bottle. In the winter it keeps things hot. In the summer, it's actually brilliant. It keeps stuff cool for up to 24 hours. Wow, that's and, that's a long time. I, I bought this one recently, Contigo. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's quite small. Uh, and I like it for it's, you know, because it's not too big, but it's the same. <laughs> it keeps things cool. So I put some ice cubes in earlier and water and then in winter, you know, it keeps things, it keeps things hot. Not, not yeah. for as long as 20 hours though. That is a long No, time. I mean, it doesn't keep things hot as long as it keeps them cold. Ah, yeah. Interestingly. Yeah. I think this is about five hours, but you know, water again, if, if you're looking at anti-aging, the skin in particular water Absolutely. is so important isn't it i mean i was talking to misha smith a while ago about this and we talk about moisturizing but moisturizing is putting oils on the skin to keep the water in mm. if there's no hydration which is equally important then the surface of the skin starts to look crepey and dry mm. and you know that's the first Thing that we notice the, those wrinkles and um, there was a research piece of research done with a group of journalists actually and they all drank three liters of water a day and mm -hmm. during that time they looked at all of the the body systems but in particular they looked at the skin mm -hmm. that was a fashion magazine i think it might have been marie claire actually mm -hmm. 
And they found that the visible signs of ageing had reduced by about 50% in a month, just drinking three litres of water a day. Yes, just something so simple and so cheap. <laughs> yeah. What's your take on um, on water filters and, um, you know, osmotic water filters? Um, what, the reverse osmosis ones? The re yes, the reverse osmosis ones that, that just strips everything out of the water, doesn't it? I don't think that's healthy. Because those no. minerals that we get from the water are really useful. Mm. I do think if you're going to buy um, spring water, you should buy it in glass bottles, not in plastic. Mm. Or if you bought it in plastic, decant it into water and then put it in the fridge. Yeah. And absolutely do not have plastic water bottles full of water in your car. No, not in a um, warm especially. Yeah. Oh, and there was a country singer. I can't remember her name. She's saying all I want to do is have some fun. But anyway, she got breast cancer and she absolutely mm. puts it down to, to touring. And, you know, she has a really healthy diet, drinks loads of water. And the only real culprit was, you know, always having these hot bottles of pl plastic bottles of water in her car. Yes. Because of the BPA in the plastic. Yeah. And Hormone that leads to the water. That's right. Hormone disruptors. Yes. Yeah. Mm, okay. Mm. Right. So, well, we're talking about healthy aging with herbal medicine. So I just want mm -hmm. to say that, um, you know, herbs have a long history of being used to help heal many diseases. And many of our modern day medicines have been discovered as a result of herbs. And ex an example is willow. It is willow bark, isn't it, Catherine? And aspirin. Well, willow bark contains um, salicylic acid yeah. but it was actually meadow sweet sweet which at the time was known as spirea which is where the name aspirin comes from oh interesting mm -hmm. i actually noticed some down the road the other day it's got lovely foamy white flowers and some people call it meadow foam because it you know it's sort of um it floats above the grass and you get these these sort of foamy creamy white flowers and it tends to grow in damp places along the sides of rivers and stuff i've been uh, really enjoying your Facebook post just lately, where you've oh, been uh, where you've been going on your walks and you've been pointing out various different wildflowers and herbs and and what their uses are. She's absolutely fascinating, Catherine. And I just want to say to people, um, if you're interested in follow, well, I, I would recommend that you do follow Catherine on social media. So on Instagram, Catherine, you're are you the Nottingham herbalist? I'm the Nottingham herbalist. I think it. It's at Knots Herbalist. Oh, that's the, the hashtag. That's the handle. Herbalist. Yeah. yeah. And the same on uh, Facebook too. Facebook, I'm Catherine Bell Chambers Medical Herbalist. Okay. It was one of those things that when I first set it up, I didn't have, you know, cohesive branding or whatever. <laughs> and every time I try and change it, something technical happens that. Oh, I know. Don't, don't know what herbalist, But herbalists are not technical. No, no. <laughs> naturopaths aren't either but you know i've been on a massive learning curve these past few years with social media i think we've, we've all had to be haven't we really well we have i mean just during lockdown in order to function social media was a godsend wasn't oh, it, it? Was. yes yes it was okay so some herbs have an ancient pedigree and it's only recently that scientific studies have shown why herbs are so good for us um but herbs can support many bodily functions the main ones being the brain the cardiovascular system the respiratory system the digestive system the urinary system and the skin and maybe the hormones as well i mean i was going to say the, the endocrine system but the, the thing endocrine. Is, we think of these things as being individual systems but they are so you know they're they're so totally meshed you know everything affects everything else and yeah. when we look at hormones you know we think of estrogen as a sex hormone you know it's it's what makes us fertile but actually it protects our it protects the heart muscle it helps keep the skin more elastic when mm. estrogen levels decrease then we we notice that we become drier all over you know mm. skin mm. eyes mouth vaginal dryness can be a problem um and actually men in later life um, as as their androgens decrease, they feel drier as well. And yes. some people don't know, but 
as those sex hormones reduce, men can get hot flushes as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, that interesting. So that's why HRT can be so useful for some for some women in particular. But whilst we're on that subject, Catherine, um, yeah. what what herbs are um, are useful for women who are going through the menopause and who are getting, you know, hot flushes, night sweats, depression, um, digestive issues, of course, that are associated with the change in hormones. Well, looks at 400 herbs on shelf and thinks of three. <laughs> yeah. of them. Um, I suppose probably one of the best known is black cohosh. You know, it's it's one that we hear, it's often often mentioned. What black cohosh does is it provides building blocks for um, the production of estrogen. And it also, it's anti-inflammatory, it reduces heat in the body. And I find that black cohosh is wonderful for women who are suffering from hot flushes and mm. particularly sweats and night sweats. Okay. Um, but it depends whether you're wanting to deal with that at the core, you know, at the source, or whether you're just looking for symptomatic relief. Yeah. Because um, a cold sage tea, if you put the sage in in cold water in the fridge in the morning um, and then start sipping it from about six o'clock in the evening, that reduces that excess sweating. Oh, that's a good tip. Mm. It, which can be very useful. And I use that also with um, with people who are going through chemotherapy for the same reason. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So <clears throat> let's let's move on to inflammation then. So inflammation can be a good sign, can't it? It can be a yeah. warning sign that a system or an organ in the body is in crisis and needs help. But chronic infl- inflammation, if left unaddressed, can damage healthy cells, tissues, and organs, causing damage to yeah. cells and, and damaging and damaging the DNA of, of the cells as well. So I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that, Catherine. Inflammation is always caused by some sort of damage to the cells somewhere in the body. Yes. But what can happen is that over time that inflammation sets in. When you first when you first see the damage, you know, for instance, if you if you sprain your ankle, the first thing that happens is it swells up. Yes. And when it swells up, that's something called complement, which is the first part of the immune system rushing to the area to bring healing complexes that will help to start the mending process, help to, you know, knit those torn muscle fibers and and help to um, protect the tissues that aren't damaged so far. And to kind of fix the joint so that you don't move it to damage it even more. That's right. It's it's a kind of our body's own plaster cast. Mm. Um, and it's actually quite important that when you first when you're first hurt, when you first experience damage, whether that's, you know, a cut or a break or a bruise or, you know, God forbid, a shotgun wound or something like that. Mm. Do not take anti-inflammatory drugs no. because that initial inflammation is essential to the healing process yes yes two weeks after the initial injury if the inflammation isn't showing signs of of decreasing that's when anti-inflammatory drugs can be helpful Mm -hmm. but it's important that you only take them early in the day because most of that healing happens at night Mm -hmm. if you need pain relief at night stick to um well maybe herbal medicines um but, you know, if you're talking about things from the pharmacy, stick to paracetamol and, you know, if you need something stronger, codeine. But mm. don't go for ibuprofen, naproxen, diclofenac. because yeah, they're not good for the stomach, are they, and the gut? Mm. They're not good for the stomach and they they halt that inflammation process. Mm. Mm. You know, if somebody breaks a bone, don't take it, just flatly don't take it. Yes. I'm just thinking, though, you know, with like a strain, a sprain or a break, um, you know, you get the pain at the the site of the injury, don't you? But when it comes to something that's that's internal, something that we can't see and and something that we may not feel straight away as well. Yes, um, like heart disease or um, disruptive function in the digestive system. Yes. Or 
or the brain inflammation in the brain because you know there's lots of research pointing to inflammation of the brain being behind dementia yeah so i'm just wondering how how can people best take care of themselves to to help slow down well prevent or at least slow down uh, these types of diseases when, when I mean I know we can do a lot with diet and lifestyle and we'll come on to that in, in a minute but are there any specific herbs or wildflowers that would that would help uh, that someone could take say on a, on a daily basis actually nettle. long term nettles are wonderful they're anti-inflammatory they they actually contain all of the neurotransmitters that the body uses and building blocks for those as well. Um, it reduces inflammation, it reduces production of histamine. And we, we think about histamine as being to do with allergies, but it's actually an important part of the inflammatory process. Allergies oh, are a hyperimmune response yes. to something that's not actually toxic. Yes. So, and you know, some, some women, it turns out, are actually allergic to their partner's sperm, which can be one of the reasons that um, they're finding it difficult to become pregnant because the body is essentially hoovering them up and, and sending them out through the immune system. Um, yes, I mean, they, they wouldn't know that, well, until they realise, well, they just can't get pregnant if they're trying for a baby, obviously, yes. Absolutely, which is why in, um, in fertility clinics, they'll often give women a big dose of steroids in the run up to harvesting eggs and and then you know any of the fertility processes mm. it, it, steroids stop the immune system in its tracks which is why it's useful as first aid in things like um, asthma which mm. is another hyperimmune response yes yes so Nettles then, nettle, nettles are a good all-rounder, so, so nettle tea for example. Nettle tea, nettle soup, um, you can make a wonderful pesto with nettles. What I would say is once they've flowered you shouldn't eat them whole, just have them as teas at that point because they, they produce um, calcium oxalate crystals which can harm the kidneys. Yes. So yes. You, want, you want newly grown nettles that haven't yet flowered. Mm. Um, yeah. but tea you can make them with them at any time in the year and actually the roots and the seeds as well as the leaves are all medicinal in different ways mm. and of course they, they can get the dried nettle uh, leaves from from you if they if they wanted to absolutely uh, i'm just i'm just thinking you know something that you said about the kidneys and i mean the kidneys are so important especially when it comes to aging absolutely because I, I think I read somewhere, Catherine, that, you know, the majority of people over the age of 70 have got some kind of kidney disease. Yes, or some kind of, certainly some kind of kidney impairment. Kidney and it's impairment. often to do with, you know, years of not drinking enough water, not flushing yeah. the kidneys through. Yeah. Um, alcohol, of course, damages the bowels, the, lam the, the liver and the kidneys. Yeah. What's astonishing is how long the body can cope with these essentially chemical insults mm. and you know manage the balance you know it's not till we're in that hour for many people as you say till the 70s or the 80s that you're starting to see the results of that damage i mean i know members of my own family catherine who have um, not not my immediate family but members of my own family who mm. have drunk copious amounts of alcohol enough to sink a battleship and yet the kidneys the kidneys were okay you know they lived oh, in really? their, they lived into their 80s and the kidneys were okay they they had a with, with liver and uh, yeah mm. with liver in particular yeah. the kidneys were okay my grandfather died at 91 having drunk neat spirits every day of his life you know from about 15. he's dutch the Old Dutch men drink a lot of gin, but they don't have it with tonic the way we do it. They they drink it as a as a spirit. Mm. Mm. And um, so a certain amount of it is to do with genetics. It is. Yes. Yes. 
you know and it is more likely that if your parents have problems with their liver and kidneys that might be something that you experience later on please yeah. excuse me i am a woman of a certain age and i have just had a hot flush and i have oh. bright red well i can't tell you look okay oh, really? <laughs> i don't think the clock is helping but um yes yeah it might be the reflection from your top as well <laughs> Right, so <clears throat> coming back to oxidation then, <clears throat> oxidation can occur when there are too many unstable molecules called free radicals and not enough antioxidants to get rid of them. So um, yeah. I'm sure, oh go on, you want to say something? Right, this idea of antioxidants is that it mops up all of the free radicals and that, you know, it immediately neutralises the function of, of those scavenging free radicals actually it doesn't work quite like that i mean from a chemical perspective what you have is unstable molecules that are looking for an for an oxygen or a carbon molecule to jump onto you know and once they found that they join up and they relax okay that's that's very very basic but you know now is not the time for a lecture in organic chemistry no, it's not. But there are a lot. <laughs> no, indeed, <laughs> definitely not. Um, but what I would say is that a lot of our physiological processes depend on oxidation. You know, things like breaking down the food in our mm. gut, enzymic mm. reactions. Mm. So we don't want to stop it completely. Mm. But what we want is to reduce those things that are causing damage to the body in so far as we can mm. um vitamin c is probably the best known antioxidant yes um, and you it's can my take my favorite vitamin vitamin c absolutely and it, and it suits me it suits my it seems to suit my genetics very very well yeah it does and actually quite a lot of people who have ibs c constipatory ibs aren't taking in enough vitamin C. Mm -hmm. And vitamin C can actually act to stimulate the bowels to a certain extent. But if I, I know, well, yes, I know people who do take quite high doses of, um, of vitamin C as, yeah. as magnesium uh, ascorbate, um, yeah. gentle vitamin C, to stimulate bowel movements when they're getting a bit sluggish. Absolutely. And actually, a magnesium ascorbate is a really useful form of magnesium as well, because that magnesium then helps to um, support the liver in detoxifying the body, particularly from metabolic waste. So the, mm. the breakdown processes of the things our body does every day. Mm. Just going back to sort of vitamin C there, well, and magnesium. So, mm. again, nettles, nettles are a rich source of vitamin C. Um, any of the green leafy vegetables, dandelion leaves. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I mean, it's one of the reasons that dandelion is diuretic. Mm. I mean, in in French, it's known as pisson lit or wet <laughs> bed, um, because it does it can stimulate the kidneys. Uh, it doesn't inevitably though. If you, the advantage with herbs is that they're balancing. So mm. if you're actually um passing out more water than you're taking in it will in fact reduce the amount that you're passing through your kidneys so if you're taking that if you're taking dandelions specifically to support the kidneys and increase excretion of excess water for instance if you're retaining water in your fingers or your ankles or what have you make sure you're drinking extra water mm. because mm. it's dehydration that causes that water retention yes Yes, that's right. Yes. Right. Thank you for that. So um, <clears throat> as we age, some people produce less stomach acid. And I see this a lot. I'm contacted by a lot yeah. of people who uh, are concerned about nutrient absorption because they may not be producing enough stomach acid. And yeah. we know that there's a link between this and osteoporosis, but more so people who take uh, proton pump inhibitor medications and i think we've touched on this before haven't we catherine yeah. so that's they... drugs like omeprazole lansoprazole isomeprazole you know yeah. they tend to be ozoles 
Yeah, and there's a stack of studies out there um, that indicate these drugs do block the absorption of certain nutrients. And in particular, I'd like to look at calcium because a lot of women are taking these drugs, uh, older women, and, um, you know, it puts them at risk of uh, osteopenia and, and osteoporosis. Yes, it does. And it, it also interferes with the absorption of iron. Yes. And you know, iron deficiency, calcium deficiency, you know, these are really big problems. I mean, mm. many women go into menopause already deficient because as, you know, as our monthly bleeds become less predictable, potentially a lot heavier, you know, we may be functionally anemic you know wow. there's less blood circulating because although at school we're told that we lose 25 mils of, of blood in a period i can tell you that and um, we work this out by um weighing a dry pad and then weighing a wet pad and then working out how many you know what the difference is yes and you know the weight is one milliliter is is approximately a gram mm -hmm. So over the course of a period, some of the ladies I work with are passing as much as half a litre. You know, so all the amount of blood over, you know, and for some women it's more than that because, you know, if you're, if you're bleeding heavily for 10 days. You know, but that's not, that's not normal, is it, Catherine? That's not normal. No, it absolutely isn't. Um, and the, but the problem I see is that the number of patients that come to me who've been to the GP and they've just been told, oh, that's just what happens in the menopause. Really? Well, or, you know, I, I, young women, pardon me, in their late teens, their early 20s, they're going in with acute pain, heavy bleeding, you know, unable to work or go to school two or three days in the month. And they're told to go home and get used to it because that's what being a woman is like. No, I can't well, see a female GP saying that, can you? Uh, it has happened, mm. but for the most part, it's young male GPs. Mm. Mm. Very often young male GPs who haven't had sisters or whose mothers <laughs> haven't communicated to them what the experience yeah. is like. Yes. I can assure you that my younger brother with two old, three older sisters knew exactly what it was like and would <laughs> never have said anything so stupid. I bet he didn't have a choice either. <laughs> I don't. No, no, bless him. Just, well just, going back, um, just going back to the PPIs again, uh, something, I, I can't remember if I mentioned this to you in our last video, but something I noticed, uh, and it kind of only dawned on me uh, a few weeks ago, actually, the number of people that um, contact me because the... Uh, for all manner of digestive uh, symptoms, mm. constipation, bloating, heartburn, acid reflux, symptoms of silent reflux. And yeah. I always ask them, you know, what medications they're taking. And invariably, they, um, they're taking a PPI. Yeah. But what, what I've also noticed is the number of people contacting me who suffer with diverticular disease and are getting diverticulitis flare-ups. And yeah. they are taking a PPI. Yeah. And so I started to do a little bit of, you know, digging into this. Mm. Because, well, yeah, PPIs, we know that uh, they can block the absorption of certain nutrients. Yeah. We know that PPIs can cause dysbiosis in the gut, mm. you know, an imbalance in the gut microbiome. And that can lead to low grade inflammation in the lining of the gut. So yes. why would PPIs not increase the risk of diverticular disease i'm i'm sure they do I mean, what happens is that as the acidity of the stomach is reduced mm. right, the mouth is alkaline so we need to chew our food well so the carbohydrates are already in the process of being digested by the mm. time they hit the stomach the stomach is very highly acidic it's about a ph of two i think mm. when it's fully you know when the the acid is fully fill the stomach now what should happen then is that that starts to break down the fats and the proteins 
And by breaking down those fats and proteins, it also starts to liberate micronutrients like, um, well, as you say, the minerals, things like calcium and iron and, and what have you. And you need that acidity to make those available to the body. Mm -hmm. If you've reduced the acidity of the stomach, then the food that goes into it isn't being broken down quickly. That's right. Other things that can make that worse are drinking lots of liquid with your with your meal because that mm. um, dilutes those digestive juices, mm. um, and and also eating very cold things because if you yes. reduce the temperature of the stomach, then the enzymes don't work as well because enzymes work within a very narrow temperature mm. range. Mm. So for goodness' sake, have your ice cream at least an hour after you've eaten your dinner. Yes. Yes. Don't have it straight away. But then when those um, breakdown products from the stomach move into the duodenum, which is alkaline again, mm -hmm. they're incompletely digested. Mm -hmm. And because they're incompletely digested, the enzymes there can't do their job properly. Mm -hmm. And then things like um, the bile, which helps to break down the remains of the fat, and and the enzymes and and the other breakdown products you know they just can't do the job and then you end up with something there that can be fermented that's bloating <laughs> that creates <laughs> bloating doesn't it it does but it changes the ph of the area which means that the bacteria that should be living in there aren't as comfortable so yeah. you're getting Things that like living on sugar rather than things that like living on protein and fat mm -hmm. in the wrong part of the gut. And okay. this just carries on through the digestive system. Mm -hmm. And You know, if it's if the big problem is just after the stomach, then you get that, you know, just below the bust, you get that jutting bloating. And that's, that's an right. indicator of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or yes. Yes. If it's lower down then you start to see constipation, bloating. And because the constipation is in the gut, mm. um, it stretches the, the little pouches inside the, the, the large intestine, mm. known as hostra, I think. Or is that? No, that's the one that holds it up, isn't it? Yes, the, um, the hostra, or the, um, yes, the, um, oh, yeah, the hostra, is that, that's the shape, the, um, yeah. the shape of the, the large bowel, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, but those those outpouchings then get stretched and stretched and stretched. And over time, they lose their elasticity. And that's when you get diverticular disease. Mm -hmm. So if over time you've been taking PPIs for years, almost inevitably, you're going to end up with, you know, damage the elasticity of the large bowel. Yes, yes. And, and diverticular disease on its own. Mm -hmm. um, it's fine, you know. You, you, you should be symptom free, but obviously, it's uh, it's if those diverticular pockets um, become inflamed, if they get certain types of bacteria, maybe trapped food, microscopic pieces of trapped food in there, then they can become inflamed and infected. And, and that's they can like, get blocked as well, you know. They can get blocked, if, yes. If you're yeah. constipated and there's you know a large amount of feces in there, yes. and then you've got bits of you know pathological bac bacteria in there they start to they start to overgrow and then you that's when you get perforation mm -hmm. you know because it stretches it past the point at which the bowel can cope yes. and then it splits the bowel and then those contents end up in the the peritoneal space which is the space around it which and is that's, so a, that's a medical emergency isn't it when that absolutely happens. And you'll know that something's happening because you'll have a fever, you'll have acute pain. Um, the bowel really only senses two things. It can sense stretch mm. and break. So, you know, if it's been cut or if it's been if it's being overstretched, either of those things are going to cause you acute pain. Mm. Mm. It's interesting. Well, with with older women, um, the number of them that report to me as having a, a hiatus hernia. It's yeah. one of the questions I always ask, actually. Um, if, if they do suffer with bloating, I would say, you know, have you been diagnosed with a hiatus hernia? Yeah. And uh, and then I kind of try to explain that there may be a link between <laughs> the bloating and the hiatus hernia, and certainly if they've got acid reflux, because it's like that knock-on effect, or it can be, can't it? 
Where Absolutely. The blood is pushing up into the diaphragm <coughs> and pushing the um, the small intestine out through the diaphragm. Well, and the stomach, of course, that, that moves up as well. So acid becomes uh, can be regurgitated up the esophagus. Yes, because there's two kinds of hiatus hernia. There's there's the bulge and then there's the sliding hiatus hernia. That's right, yes. With the sliding hiatus hernia, the hole in the in the diaphragm, so you've got a hole like that, which is normally quite tight. Yeah. But over time, if the diaphragm's been stretched by lots of upper um, digestive system bloating, yeah. then that starts to stretch open. I mean, there are other things that can cause it. It's partly you know it's partly genetic or epigenetic Pre pregnancies can cause it heavy lifting um yeah. if, if you're overweight if you're carrying a lot of weight around your middle as well i suppose and yeah. also the um gymnasts and sports people who mm. Mm. heavily work for core muscles that can that can put pressure on the abdomen um less mm. so but, it, but certainly there are reasons why heavy lifters wear a belt, you know, is, right. is to protect all of those muscles. Yes. Uh, I mean, when, when someone contacts me with, with such symptoms, the first thing I, I recommend is, you know, our natural digestive enzymes. Just take one of those before before lunch and before yes. dinner. And it's amazing how quickly it can... Um, it can reduce the bloating, you know, the discomfort from the hiatus hernia and the acid reflux as well. I mean, I must admit, I've recommended those to four people this week and it's only Wednesday. <laughs> wow, thank you. So what, what symptoms have they displayed then, Catherine? Um, bloating, gas, digestive discomfort, the feeling that their food is taking a very long time to digest. Mm. Because the other thing is, if you're, the stomach acidity is reduced, then it takes much longer for that process to happen. Mm. So it'll sit there for ages and ages. Yeah. Other things that are important is that if you're eating um, raw vegetables or fruit, have those before you have your meat and cheese, etc. Yes. Because that triggers stomach emptying. Mm. Okay, and, and what what herbs <clears throat> can someone eat or chew on before they have a meal that would uh, that would help with di digestion of that meal? Does it depend what, what what the meal contains? Actually, no, because the the pro whatever you're eating, the process is the same. You know, it follows the same steps. And I always recommend that people take a something bitter. Mm. sort of while they're preparing their meal mm -hmm. ideally about half an hour before you have your digest before you have your meal yes because what that does is it stimulates salivation and when it stimulates salivation then that tells the stomach that it's time to start producing renin and pepsin and the the, the hydrochloric acid and it it stimulates a more natural process mm. particularly if you're eating something fast food is really bad for us not just because it's processed but because if there hasn't been any preparation time you haven't had that time to start salivating and get you know that interest in your meal mm -hmm. and that's not just that's not just mental that's entirely physiological yes yeah i must admit uh, <clears throat> we don't eat a lot of processed food here I do like I do like the occasional pizza mm -hmm. <laughs> from either Ricardo or Marks and Spencer, and I quite like fish chips and mushy peas as well. Uh, yeah, but I always... actually, those two are particularly bad, and I would absolutely say if you enjoy them, make sure you take a digestive enzyme before. I always do. <laughs> I take one before and I take one after as well. Yeah, it's a good idea because you're likely to eat more than you normally would. So your stomach's going to be stuffed. Mm. And also that combination of carbohydrate and fat really doesn't occur in nature and the body isn't evolved to deal with it. No. You know, no. they're normally separate things. Mm. The body can kind of deal with the separate things, but when they've been baked together or, you know, with the with the batter on, on fish and chips, that um 
that complex of carbohydrate and fat it's really difficult to break down it's really difficult it can be yeah. and um and another reason i take um you know a digestive enzyme before and after um a pizza or fish fish and chips is not just to make it more comfortable you know so i don't get bloated and uncomfortable but also it helps with transit time in the bowel because you can bet your bottom dollar catherine if i don't take the enzymes i'll get constipated yeah <laughs> And one of the main point, the main jobs of the of the large bowel, which is where constipation typically starts, is to remove water mm. from that mixture of of food, etc., um, so that you got got a an easy stool to pass, mm. and that water is recycled by the body, mm. and that particularly happens if you don't eat drink enough water because the body is going to need to hang on to what it's got mm -hmm. yes um, but also you know if you've got all of this dysbiosis going on then it's you know you've got the double whammy mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. drinking more water taking a, a digestive enzyme but if you're looking at herbs that will help the bitters will stimulate the natural function of the gut you know from first principles yes so like the going back to the dandelion leaves and, and the nettles again. Yes. Mm. And actually, a, a salad of bitter herbs was a very common entree. Mm. You know, and we've, that, actually. we've bred out the bitterness in our lettuces because people like, you know, like nice bland flavours. What about rocket? I mean, I love rocket and that's, oh, you know, rocket that is wonderful. <laughs> no, I, we grow it in the garden and always have it with a, with a salad. Yes, I, I love it in like a, um, a whole wheat wrap. I put rocket yes. in there and I put some uh, feta cheese in and uh, those mm. lovely heritage tomatoes that are around at the moment, you know, all the oh, different yes. coloured tomatoes and then a little bit of um, olive oil oh, and some salt right, and pepper, delicious. Right, so talking about food, um, yes, yeah. how do diet and lifestyle choices affect ageing? Well, I've, I've kind of put this together that we can talk about. So. It's a no-brainer, really, isn't it, Catherine? You know, we need a well-balanced, a well-balanced diet rich in essential nutrients, vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, and phytochemicals to support overall health and cellular function, potentially helping to slow down aging. Um, so, are there any particular herbs? I mean, you've talked about the bitter herbs, but are there any other herbs that we can add to our food that can help slow down aging? <laughs> that's yeah, that's well that's a big question isn't it it is a big question echinacea is an interesting herb There's i love a, it one of my favorites as you know yes oh absolutely and a woman called sandra miller in the states did some research with mice um now i don't like talking about um talking about animal studies but this one thankfully only invite involved them eating a really healthy diet and living much longer than usual so this is isn't too we'll bad we'll have that one then we'll have yes. that really. so what she did was she um included echinacea powdered echinacea as part of their daily mouse chow and she found that the ones that were having I think it was a, a gram a day. Yes, it was about a gram a day um, per mouse. Lived almost three times as long as the ones that didn't. Well, that's fascinating because, um, <clears throat> as you know, I've been I've been taking echinacea for many many years. Since since before you and I uh, even knew each other, going yeah, back to the absolutely. early 1990s when I had you know my issues with chronic fatigue after yeah. a vi after a virus, and I remember reading at the time. So I, so I must have read it somewhere that echinacea was you know was really good to help um, to help support the immune system. But I also remember reading that um, it shouldn't be taken every day. For long periods of time. I mean, do you do you concur with that, Catherine? It's not true. It was theoretical. Mm. Um, the idea they 
stimulating something for long periods of time is a really bad idea but right. echinacea isn't a stimulant mm -hmm. it doesn't stimulate the immune system it is an immunomodulator okay which means that um when more you know immune complexes are required it helps the body to produce more mm -hmm. when fewer are needed it helps to reduce it but it helps what one of the things it does is it helps to maintain adequate levels of neutrophils which yeah. are white blood cells they're the first line defenses so they're the ones that catch they're the ones that catch the many hundreds of thousands of bacteria that we encounter every day and you know dispatch them into the digestive system mm. Around 70% of the volume of our feces is actually dead bacteria and cells from the body. It's, there's actually very little of our food that isn't used. Mm. You know, if if you're seeing obvious bits of food in, in your in your poo, then frankly your well, digestive system is not digesting very well. Mm. You need a, you need help. At the very least, a digestive enzyme and eating, drinking more water. Yes. Um, but potentially a bit more assistance than that. But because it it supports the immune system, it's perfectly safe to take regularly. And for a while, there was a concern that it might not be safe for children. But having done empirical studies, looked at many thousands and thousands of children who'd received echinacea from a qualified herbalist over a 30-year period we found that there was one one event of um, an allergy an allergic reaction and it is a member of the daisy family the compositi and a small but significant number of people are allergic to those types of plants hmm. it actually looks like a daisy the echinacea flower it's very similar isn't it it is yes you've got those little florets in the middle which are the sort of the brown um the brown center and then you've got the the petals around the outside which are kind of the that that sends the news out to the bees that it's it's they're open for business <laughs> amazing isn't it so yes when i was taking it back in the early 1990s mm. not as a fluid extract as a tincture mm. i took it every day for at least 18 months and it's perfectly uh, safe to do so yeah I, well, I thought so and i felt okay and I, mm. and I i was getting better you know my health was improving so you know the fluid extract that you made up for me that amazing fluid extract of echinacea that you made up for me a few months ago and that i started taking well, I'm not taking it at the moment because I feel really, really well. But if you're saying to me that I can take it prophylactically um, every day, then I'm going to start taking it again. But I'm assuming I only need a very small amount. I would only be taking a millimeter, a milliliter a day at this time of year. A milliliter a day. What does what does that look like on a teaspoon, Catherine? <laughs> um, I would actually get yourself a measuring syringe. Um, for oh, any, pharmacy, idea. Health, yeah. any pharmacy will sell five mil measuring syringes because it's an easy yeah. way of of dosing babies with medicine. Yes, yeah. Um, did you say a milliliter a day? Yes. I wouldn't have any more than that because you don't need it. No, I know. <laughs> and and to be perfectly honest, a fluid extract of echinacea is quite a potent flavour. It's got a real tingly sense on the tongue and the and the lips. Yes. And that's caused by a constituent called alkyl amides. And they are one of the active components of, of echinacea. But if you don't get that tingle, then your echinacea isn't worth using. Ah, okay, good tip. Well, I've put it in the fridge for now. Is that okay? That's fine. I mean, you don't need to put tinctures in the fridge usually, but when the temperature's over 25 degrees consistently, it's worth doing. Well, even when it's been opened, I don't have to put it in the fridge? No, because tinctures are preserved with alcohol. Alcohol, yes. As long as it's kept in a cool, dry cupboard, yes. away from yes. bright light, yes. it, it'll be fine for... Well, there's somebody on my course did some research on old tinctures and found particularly things like um, root tinctures. 
that are quite robust to start with were still okay 20 30 years later <laughs> however how, how do they know um, they just... well, they look at the chemical profile you know liquid gas chromatography will tell you whether the profile is the same as it is with a newly made tincture mm, amazing but well, once you have flowers like um elderflower or um chamomile etc they're a little more um they've got more volatiles in them so they don't last quite as long and also things that have a very strong number of um alkaloids um things like deadly nightshade datura um henbane which i use in very small quantities because they're antispasmodics and also they um, they dry up dry up excess secretions hmm. so belladonna for instance is is used for um severe colic pains because it reduces hmm. that graunching sort of tightening that and i do pain, yes. yeah and i use that quite often with people who have diverticulitis or you hmm. know diverticular okay that's interesting i've just i've just thought about something and i need to ask it now otherwise i'll forget but do you do you Probably. actually do for, foraging um uh, courses in in nottinghamshire i have done i've not done one for ages actually i sort of stopped doing them during the during lockdown mm. um, for obvious reasons um but i quite often I quite often do herb walks at Windmill Community Gardens. Ooh, um, and I've been talking to the lovely people at St Anne's about doing some doing some stuff there. What, at the allotments? Yeah. Mm. Well, they've got community gardens there as well. And it's a, it's a way of introducing people to plants in a really easy way. Mm. Mm. And, and if you do them, do you put them on your Facebook page or on your Instagram? So I put them on my Instagram. I also put them on my, um, oh, what do you call it, on my newsletter. Ah, okay. Right. I always ask people who who contact me if they'd like to go on my, um, you know, would like to receive my newsletter. But I have to say I haven't exactly inundated anybody with it yet. <laughs> well, do you know, I don't know if I do get your newsletters. How often do you send them out? Well, I think the last one was about a year ago. <laughs> That is typical. <laughs> oh, not, I'm so busy doing what I do. I know, Catherine. I know it's it's a time thing, isn't it? But you've got all this wonderful knowledge that you need mm. to share with people. But, uh, you know, at least you're on Facebook and Instagram, and it, it, it's lovely yeah. to see you on there anyway. <laughs> and I am working with um, a wonderful woman. Do you know Ursula Kelly? Um, she's she, a photographer from Nottingham. I mean, she now li lives in one of the Hebrides. Of course but, I do. Yes, yeah. yes. Lovely yeah. Irish lady with all the beautiful I hair. I know, I know. She once did a photo shoot for me at the clinic oh. a few years ago before before she moved up there. Yes. Yeah. Well, well, she's she's a a personal branding expert, and she's teaching me how to be better at this stuff. So, you know, watch this play, this space. You just need need to be yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just just be just be as they say, authentic. Yes. Yes. I mean, yeah. it seems to work for Marmite, doesn't it? <laughs> it does, it does. Well, not for everyone, but... Um... <laughs> yes. Well, yes, yeah, so I wrote a blog on this subject recently, Kathleen, yeah. in protein and how important, you know, adequate consumption of protein is, especially for older individuals, as well, especially for women, for maintaining muscle mass and strength. So, of course, you know, they can get protein from... Um, well, from the diet. Um, I mean, weight for weight, there's actually more protein in broccoli than there is in a steak. I know that's amazing. <laughs> Can't get my head around that. But uh, but again, I've looked at, um, you know, members of my own family um, as they've gone into their 80s and how how frail, how frail they're looking. And I think a lot of it is, well, not just lack of protein, but lack of physical activity as well. Because if you don't use them, you'll you'll lose them when it comes to muscles. Well, it's absolutely true. I mean, most of the diseases of old age are actually diseases of immobility. Mm. The more we move, the more active we are. 
the better our circulation is, the better our, you know, our muscles protect our joints. Mm. You know, mm. I mean, if you if you have really terrible arthritis, the best thing you can do for yourself is strengthen the muscles around the joint because mm. that takes some of the weight off and um, it opens up that joint capsule so that mm. the bones are not pressing against each other. Mm. And to have some really good massages, you know, to get all the knots out of those muscles. Again, to take the uh, to take the pressure off the joints. And actually, interestingly, most arthritic conditions, and that includes osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, gout, um, the infective arthritis. Is, um, if you get the kidneys right, the pain and inflammation in the joints improves, and gout is most definitely. Um, and a bigger problem for people who are who are dehydrated. Mm, so okay. when I'm working with gout, yes, you want to get the pain down, but you really want to get the kidneys working. You need that person to be drinking lots of water so that that uric acid can be solubilized and then moved out through the kidneys. So that's with gout and with rheumatoid arthritis in particular. All of them. All of them, yes. Yeah. Well, yes, for everything. Just drink, just drink more water. <laughs> Drinking more water is, you know, it's the single best thing that you, you know, if I was saying, you know, three things you can do to improve your health as you age, I would say drink more water, move more, eat more fat and protein. Mm. And the fourth one would be eat less sugar. Yes, yes. Well, because yes. actually there's nothing promotes inflammation like sugar more than sugar does and there are amazing herbs that will help with insulin sensitivity because the more sugar you eat the less sensitive your cells are to insulin yeah. insulin is a key that sort of comes along and and opens the cell to accept circulating sugars if the cell has just seen you know, 25 insulin molecules sort of go by the next one that comes along it's you know it's a bit like hawkers at the door Somebody mm. comes up, you can only have so many tea towels. Mm. <laughs> and there's a point at which the cells just stop responding to insulin. So type 2 diabetes is very different from type 1 diabetes. Mm. Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease where destruction of the islet cells in the pancreas mean that you don't produce insulin or you don't That's produce right, enough yes. of it. Type 2 diabetes is a lifestyle disease caused by the overconsumption of sugar. Mm. And, and by sugar, I also mean, you know, carbohydrates. Yes. yes. So refined carbohydrates for the most part. Um, and, and it's a condition, unlike type 1 diabetes, that can be completely reversed. It can. You need not have those symptoms. And the, the simplest way of dealing with that um, is to reduce the amount of carbohydrate you consume. No more white bread. In fact, if you can cut the bread out altogether. Mm everything will thank you bread is delicious but it's not that healthy in any of its forms no, no. i mean sprouted rye bread that's pretty healthy because you've got all the enzymes in there that help you break it down anyway but it seems to be um there used to be a wonderful um small bakery down mm. oh down near canterbury i think it was called artisan bread organic and they yeah. used to bake, um, you know, sprouted um, sprouted bread. But unfortunately, they just didn't survive COVID. I don't, I don't suppose you, you said they had to close down. I don't suppose you know of any, um, you know, local um, bread. I don't, I'm afraid. No, no, I but don't. It might be worth seeing whether um, the bakery in primary does it. Hmm. Because they do some very interesting forms of, of bread. And, of course, they do the... Uh, gorgeous soda bread the the sourdough Wait, where are they catherine a primary up um up beyond canning circus oh. there's an old primary school that's been turned into a community resource and they've got a they've got a kitchen there and then they've got classrooms and all sorts of other things art studios but the bakery at primary is just amazing and they use um i think they use flour from Green's Windmill, it's locally produced oh, and then wow. they use... Are they on social media? Are they on Instagram? They are, yes. Right. I'll, have to, I'll have to look it up, but I I'll, know that... I'll find um, them, don't worry, I'll, I'll find them, I'll start following them. 
Um, well, it's easy at Windmill Gardens often takes them gifts of of herbs and things that they grow there. That's another community garden in, in Nottinghamshire. Uh, we're very lucky to have all these community gardens in Nottingham, aren't we? We are. I mean, actually, for, for natural health and, and actually for being a woman in business, Nottingham is the most amazing place to live. Yes, yes. I you know, love Nottingham. Yeah, I do too. I mean, I didn't grow up here. I grew up in the south. <laughs> I know uh, you did. You're a southerner, aren't you? Yes, yeah. Yes, well, it's, my, it's my home city. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of a nomad. I moved out as soon as I could at eighteen, you know, and I've been in the Midlands ever since. <laughs> Let's go back to oxidative stress. So you can get oxidative stress from poor diet, you know. So we talked about a high intake of processed foods, ultra high processed foods in particular. And I did a video a couple of weeks ago with Jane Barrett, the nutritional therapist, yeah. about the prevalence of ultra high processed foods now. So sugary drinks, yeah. unhealthy fats, along with excessive alcohol consumption and exposure to environmental toxins, all these can lead to disease and in particular cancer. Yeah. Um, so it's important to eat a diet high in anti antioxidants and reducing exposure to harmful substances that can mm. help combat oxidative stress. Um, I mean, I know I'm a herbal, but one of the things that I would say is make sure your food looks as close to the way it looked when it grew. Yes. You know, whether that's vegetables or whether that's, you know, animal foods. You know, once it's been frozen dried processed spray dried mucked about with you know it becomes more difficult for your body to process it yes i'm sure you've heard of the nova classification of foods haven't you catherine yes um different classification depending upon how um how the foods have been manufactured what's been what's been taken away and, and what's been added really yeah. interesting so uh, again, chronic inflammation is associated with various age-related diseases and can accelerate the aging process. Particularly, so dementia. Of, pardon? Particularly dementia. Particularly um, dementia. Yes. And interestingly, there are um, research physicians who are now referring to certain types of dementia as type three diabetes. I've read that. Yeah, I've read that recently. And I also believe. And this is something I can't prove, but it's it's something I've I've observed over my, you know, sort of 20 years in herbal medicine, you know, from when I, I started training in 2003, I think. So, yeah, it's 20 years since I first started my professional journey as a herbalist. I think there's a link between PPIs and infl and um, and dementia. Yeah. Isn't it? Yes. What? Because the blocking of certain nutrients. Yes, because it interferes with the uptake of certain nutrients. And I think there's something else going on there. If you stop the body doing something it's supposed to do. Then and you, you know, I, I think there, there is a place for them. Very short term first aid for people who have stomach ulcers so that the. Um, the healing process can take place and then you stop taking them. But most but, people put on them and they're never taken off them again. Oh, I, I know, tens of thousands of people. But but what's your take on Barrett's esophagus and PPIs, Catherine? Now, that's an interesting one. And I'm sure my husband won't mind me mentioning this. But since he had um, chemotherapy, part of which came as a daily tablet for nearly six months, well, when I say a daily tablet, he actually had six in the morning and six at night for nearly six months. Okay. Um, it's a, it's called capecitabine and it's a fluorouracil, which is quite damaging. Uh, he had a form of bowel cancer and, and yes. that is, you know, you want something that's going to create oxidative stress in order to destroy the, to destroy the tumour. Yes. Um, that's a whole other discussion. But... It did cause reflux. It did increase the acidity in his stomach. And he has Barrett's esophagus. Mm. And actually, we managed that really well using um, slippery elm and marshmallow root. Mm. And mm. actually, when they first noticed that he had he had very severe ulceration in, in his esophagus and in his stomach, 
and they asked him to go home and take 40 milligrams of um, PPIs twice a day. Wow. He didn't. He came home and took slippery elm and marshmallow root powder um, <laughs> before and after every meal and in the morning and at night before he went to bed and if he felt any discomfort in the night. And within six within six weeks, he'd gone from stage five ulceration, which is ulcer, ulcers of more than five centimetres in diameter, to almost no no visible ulceration. So he had, he had a scope, he had a camera then down. Yes, yeah, on down both occasions. Head. Yeah. But, but, but is it, has, does he still have a diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus? Yes, because the problem with Barrett's esophagus is that it, um, that, re, you know, the reflux, all of that acid coming up into the esophagus, which is essentially an alkaline space, um, physically damages the lining of the esophagus and it, it means changes it the cells that line the esophagus yeah. yes and they so can't be reversed it doesn't appear to be the case mm -hmm. i suspect that there's a possibility that if i included centella in that at the time oh, this is research i've done since centella asiatica also known as hydrocotyl asiatica um go to cola there's a lot of really good research for um, improving the quality of healing. And actually, you can use it as an infused oil on scarring, and it normalizes those scars so quickly. Does it? Well, and, and health and healthy cells, healthy tissues replace yeah. the scar tissue. But what we don't know is how important the massage is in that process, because mm. the, the research studies that there have been have said that um, massaging a centella infused oil into the skin twice a day for two minutes normalizes scarring. I've used it myself because I used to have terrible acne as a teenager and actually up until my 30s. Oh. Um, and I used massaging centella in, uh, oil onto my skin twice a day and actually apart from a bit of crinkling around my chin here you really can't tell that no, no that i can't. had such awful acne oh. <clears throat> so i don't know it might help it is possible it's re it's reversible but i haven't seen any studies that would oh. would prove that always very cautious when someone contacts me yeah. and uh, they've got Barrett's esophagus and um, <clears throat> they want to come off their PPI. And, uh, I think it's possible to do it, oh. but you would need to take something else instead because you need something to protect the stomach. Yeah. Or protect yeah. the esophagus. But I always, I always recommend probiotics and digestive enzymes. And if they're not eating oily fish three times a week, you know, omega-3, essential fatty acids. Yeah. But, Really, that as far as I'm concerned, that's a conversation that they need to have with the GP, really, because we just don't have access to their medical records, do we? We don't know how yeah. severe Barrett's is and what else is going on. And the fact is that the GPs don't know. No, they know that taking this drug will reduce the amount of acid that's produced, but actually, beyond that, they're not pharmacologists and they mm. get a very small um, pharmacology module when they're training mm. i mean i had i had two years of pharmacology as part of my herbal medicine degree wow. so generally i know more about the drugs that i'm prescribed than, than, than the he do. does yes <laughs> okay so yes we need the greatest respect for gps and my gp oh. is absolutely wonderful so do i i mean the, the stress and pressure that they're under at the moment uh, so yes. before we go on to this, I just wanted to talk about um, type 2 diabetes again. Okay. Mm. There are a couple of herbs that are easy to get hold of and massively reduce the amount of um, circulating sugar. So, you know, blood readings on, on finger prick tests and okay. also help increase sensitivity to the insulin that you're producing. And one of those is mulberry leaf mulberry mulberry leaf taken mm -hmm. as a tea two or three times a day and the other is fenugreek mm. fenugreek seed and you can buy fenugreek seed capsules um this is one where we know because we've done some research a group of herbalists we've done some 
you know, I mean, not double blind randomized control trials, but we've done work with, with our own patients and we've tried them on several different fenugreek capsules. And frankly, the cheapest work just as well as the most expensive. So you don't have to go anywhere expensive for it, but taking mm -hmm. two fenugreek capsules with each meal makes a huge difference to wow. circulating sugar levels. Mm, okay, well, thank you for that. I'm very uh, conscious of the time. <clears throat> I'm keeping yes, you a bit, uh, a bit longer than I thought I would, so I'm just going to whiz through these. Okay. <clears throat> so yes, we need a diet rich in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, healthy fats, such as omega-3s and lean protein to support healthy aging. Yeah. Uh, we also need, and we've touched on this, uh, hydration for maintaining yep. overall health and healthy aging. Keeps the skin hydrated, supports organ function, particularly the digestive system and urinary system. Physical activity, of course, crucial for maintaining muscle strength, bone density, flexibility, and cardiovascular health. And actually stretching is really mm. important because mm. what happens over time is that the capsule that the mus mus muscle is in shrinks. So if you're constantly sitting like this at a desk, Yes. It's really important to stretch outwards and to open those because these muscles here get tight. And, and over time, mm. Mm. Yes. You know, and actually, if what you do all day is running or digging, then you need to stretch those muscles out. Mm. And you find that with the serious, you know, the serious steroid taking bodybuilders, they don't like to stretch out because it reduces the apparent bulk of the muscle. But that's a, yes. essentially deforming the body. And what we yes. want is, is lean, flexible muscle that will help keep us upright and support us. Yes, and support our joints. I remember when I did uh, <clears throat> massage therapy, which I did for many, many years before I trained in colon hydrotherapy. Oh, and I would often uh massage the pectoralis muscles here and uh, at the same time because i found that you know people were like that walking around with oh, short yeah. pectoralis muscles and then i would also um if it, if it was a, a woman i would at the same time show her how to drain her own breast tissue you know with massage techniques because that's so important well well i think really i'm sure you do catherine you know, and Absolutely. drain and, and massage towards the lymph nodes in the um, in the armpit. Yes, um, especially because women that suffer with you know cysts in the breasts or get uh, mastitis. Yeah. I think every newly pregnant woman should be shown how to do that that breast draining massage because mm. it would reduce the incidence of of mastitis significantly. Mastitis. Yes. Yes. And the other reason that water is so important is that alongside the blood system, a long time that, alongside the, the vascular system, all of your vessels and veins, is the lymphatic system. And that requires water in order to carry away toxins and metabolic wastes into the digestive system so you can get rid of them. Mm -hmm. I think the I think the theme that's running through this whole video, Catherine, is drink more water. Absolutely. Yes, drink more water. Uh, sleep. Yes, so mm -hmm. very important. Sufficient, good quality sleep essential for overall well being, and can affect various aspects of aging. And good sleep promotes cell repair, hormone regulation, immune function, and good memory. Although, you know, when you start to go through the menopause, um, getting a good night's sleep can be a challenge. And, and after the menopause, actually. It can be. And actually, you know, as we get older, we need a little less sleep, apparently. Mm, it's a shame because I love sleep. Sleep is wonderful. It makes me feel really good. You know, waking <laughs> up in the morning when you've had a really nourishing night's sleep is, is one of the best feelings in the world. It is. But I, I don't need as much sleep now, do you? Do you still find that? No, I mean, certainly in my teens, I would fall asleep at midnight and happily sleep straight through till midday the following day. <laughs> I mean, given the opportunity, which didn't happen very often. But but your brain is still developing in your teens. Mm. But getting enough sleep is essential to um, to being able to concentrate well and being able to complete complex tasks. Mm. And they found that every hour of sleep less than eight hours that you have is equivalent in a reduction in um, mental acuity to a pint of beer. 
Right. Okay. So essentially you're running around drunk because most yeah. of the most of the healthy repair that happens to the body does so um in the first three or four hours of sleep, but all of that healing happens at night. Mm. And this is why you shouldn't take anti-inflammatories at night. You should take mm. those in the morning mm. because you're inhibiting cellular repair by by taking anti-inflammatories at night. Mm. I watch my little granddaughter when she's sleeping sometimes, you know, and she'll sleep from about half past seven until mm, half past six, seven o'clock the following morning. And she is in such a deep sleep. <laughs> I, don't, oh, isn't it? I don't think anything would wake her up, actually. Yes, it's mm. wonderful. I, I find nowadays that I quite like lounging. I quite like reposing. <laughs> yes. Oh. You know what I mean? Especially in the afternoon for half an hour. <laughs> yes, we've got some rather nice lounges in, lounges in the garden at the moment. And um, actually last night I was, you know, when it got a little bit cooler, sat outside and just watched the satellites going about. In, you know, yes, yes. I saw a satellite the other night. I thought, wow, that star is really, really bright. But it wasn't twinkling. It was just moving. Yes, it was just moving very, very slow. I thought, oh, that's a satellite. Right, mm. just to finish off, where are we, this one? If we could just choose three herbs to help keep us young in mind and body as we age, which three would they be? Echinacea, because mm -hmm. of its profound support of the immune system. And um, we know that it, you know, if the immune system is working well, it keeps us healthier for longer and keeping us healthier for longer keeps us looking younger. I would say a herb called Bacopa monieri, also known as Brahmi. Well, I would never heard of them. There are three or four Indian herbs that are, are known colloquially as Brahmi. That's why we use the Latin binomials. It's it's an adaptogen, but among other things, it helps with uptake of oxygen in the brain, which means we concentrate more easily. Okay. I use it a lot for brain fog in, in menopause. And it's anti-inflammatory. It helps regulate blood sugar. Um, you know, adaptogens help us deal more effectively with stress. And we talked about stress last time. Yes. Um, managing stress by moving around, drinking more water, um, getting outside mm. is, is really important. But this is a herb that will help the body deal more effectively with stress. And it oh. also helps with blood sugar as well. Mm. That's not one I've come across before. So thank you for that. Um, and I would say Plantago lanceolata, also known as ribwort plantain, okay. which is my absolute favourite herb for mucous membranes. And since all of the line, you know, the eyes, the nose, the kidneys, the digestive system, the urinary tract, the reproductive organs, you know, the inside of all of our organs have some element of mucous membrane. Mm. And that mucous membrane is all really, it's functional. That's where, you know, the digestion takes place, the filtering in the kidneys takes place, the detoxification in the liver takes place. You know, we want that, you know, and when we're breathing, to be able to breathe naturally, um, it enhances something called the mucociliary escalator. Mm -hmm. So we have these little villi, microvilli, like we do on the digestive system, Yes. on the inside of the lungs and the inside of the alveoli and they move like this and that helps to you know sort of wave any debris that we breathe in out of the lungs um if there's an inflammation it's those that move the mucus that's developed with all of the gunk yes it helps to move that plantago lanceolata also thins mucus so it's wonderful for sinus problems. It's wonderful for, you know, for dry mouth, all of that sort of thing. And yeah. it's a really nice tea. And anyone with uh, respiratory conditions like bronchitis, uh, yeah. trying to think bronchitis, pleurisy, maybe pleurisy. Um, pleurisy, yes, though. In fact, I would use pleurisy root for pleurisy. Oh, OK. 
uh, Euptoria. Uh, it's one of the Euptorias. Um, but pleurisy root, which no, it's not a Euptoria. I'm going to have to go and look it up. Um, <laughs> but pleurisy root is is the thing for pleurisy because it, it works in that space between the lungs and the um, the lining of the peritoneum. Yeah, because it's, it's an infection in there, which means that as as you breathe in, it sticks. And if you listen to the chest, um, even using a glass, you know, a, a small glass, hold, held it against the chest wall and listen through that, you can hear this sort of crackling noise. Crackle. It's very painful as well, isn't it? Plurisi? Very painful. Mm. Right. Well, Catherine, I just want to say a huge thank you. We've gone way over time again. <laughs> okay, yes. Uh, Not so much. Much. And <laughs> thank you, everyone, for listening. And I will be so. So this video will be available to watch on the, on the Just for Tummies um, mm -hmm. Facebook page, on the YouTube channel, on the LinkedIn page, and we will also. I'll also be. Oh, I think it's also on Tummy Talk in the Tummy Talk community on yeah. Facebook, and I will be sharing it in a newsletter either next week or the week after. And once it's done, I will also put it on my socials yes. and what yes. have you. Uh, well, it will be on YouTube. Where are we now? It's Wednesday, isn't it? It will be on YouTube by next Wednesday. Okay, if you want to check on the Just for Tummies YouTube channel, um, you, can, you can share it from there as well. Mm. Oh, that, but obviously, social mm. media. Yeah, share it from the social media sites, the Just for Tummies social media sites. Right. Well, thank you so much again, Catherine, and thank you everyone for listening. I really hope. Um, <clears throat> That helped you. Uh, I always find it fascinating, um, mm. herbs and their uses, and there's no one better than Catherine Bell Chambers from explaining to us how they work. <laughs> well, it's my thank pleasure. you very much, then, Catherine, and thank you, everyone. Bye-bye for now. Thank you.